Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks, which I founded to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, www.compassionatecooks.com. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here talking to all of you again. I hope you're all happy and healthy. Incidentally, I have been nominated for two Veg News Veggie Awards, one for my column in Veg News Magazine on entertaining and one for my blog, which in many ways mirrors the topics and content of this podcast. So if you have a few minutes, I would be very grateful if you would visit vegnews.com, www.vegnews.com and complete their survey. It doesn't take very long. And you can vote for me in both those categories and perhaps even do a write-in category voting for our podcast, this podcast, Vegetarian Food for Thought. They don't have a podcast category, but I think they should. So let them know that this podcast is your favorite, if indeed it is, and do encourage them to have a podcast category for their, for their Veggie Awards. The sponsor for today's episode is a perfect fit for today's topic because we're talking all about tofu today. Our sponsor, Synergia Soy Foods, makes absolutely delicious tofu and non-dairy cheese, and I'm so thrilled to share them with you today. Their website is SynergiaSoyFoods.com. I'll spell that out for you. It's www.Synergia, S-U-N-E-R-G-I, Synergia Soy Foods. Dot com. Not only do they make an absolutely delicious feta in three different flavors, there's tomato, garlic, lemon, oregano, and Mediterranean herb, and there's also a blue cheese, but they also have an entire line of what they call more than tofu. This is like a flavored tofu, and it's absolutely delicious. It comes in a number of different flavors, and I have tried almost every one of them, and I really do love every one. The flavors include spicy Thai, which is fantastic, and pesto, garlic shiitake, uh, Italian herb, spinach jalapeno, which might be my favorite, Indian masala, peanut and ginger, and savory portobello. I think I've actually tried all of these, and they're delicious. They come in eight-ounce blocks, and you can use them for stir-fries. You can add them to pasta dishes, or you can do what I did and just add them as part of a salad. And I love that on each of the packages for the different flavors, they offer suggestions for how to use that particular flavor. And people often complain that tofu is too bland, and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to flavor it, and Synergia takes care of that problem with this tofu. It's absolutely delicious. They are certified organic and of course they're vegan and they're gluten-free and wheat-free so again visit their website and ask how you can get a hold of their tofu or their feta cheese uh, they're available in some stores on the east coast i know and soon to come to the san francisco bay area but ask your grocer to carry them and then put them in touch with Synergia Soy Foods so that they can carry them in your store but again visit their website SynergiaSoyFoods.com. so thank you thank you so much Synergia. thank you for your for your sponsorship now, even though I have a podcast episode on soy about how it's not evil and a podcast episode about tempeh and how fabulous it is, I have been reminded that I don't have an episode just about tofu and y'all have been requesting one. So here it is. I want to talk all about this fantastic food and the many things you can do to it and the many things you can do with it. I was teaching a class recently and one of the students was so cute. She was pretty new to tofu and she was definitely open to it, but she had never really cooked with it and didn't really like it when she had had it out. And I was talking about the many things you can do with it and said, you know, I just love to cut it up and add it to salad. And she said, you mean you eat it just like that? And I said, well, yeah, it's you know really good. And I love tofu and it's hard for me to just look at this block of tofu and not want to eat the whole thing. And she said, um, so will this class make us get to that point too? And I said, yeah, I mean, she was so open and she just was just, you know, kind of in awe of someone who would just eat plain old tofu. And she wanted to get to that point and was hoping that the, the class would inspire her to. So hopefully it, it will. Many people who have tried tofu and didn't like it think all tofu is the same and they never try it again. And it's a real shame because not all tofu is created equal. There are many different brands and many different textures and tastes. It's like someone saying they don't like soy milk. It's a huge sweeping generalization because commercial soy milks all taste different. They all taste different depending on the sweeteners they use, etc. So give tofu a chance. <laughs> Just give it a chance. And 
again, experiment with different brands, and we'll talk about some of them. First, a little history. Tofu originated in China about 2,000 years ago, and while the details of its discovery are uncertain, legend has it that it was discovered by accident when a Chinese cook added the seaweed nagari to a pot of soybean milk, causing it to curdle, and the result was tofu. Tofu was introduced into Japan in the 8th century, where it was originally known as okabe, but it was not called tofu until the 15th century, and it didn't gain its great popularity in Japan until the 17th century. Tofu's popularity in the West has mirrored the increasing interest in healthier foods, first gaining widespread attention. During the 1960s, tofu has been skyrocketing in popularity ever since research has begun to reveal the many significant health benefits of this food. So what is tofu? What is this white block of what is also called bean curd? Not a particularly appetizing sounding name, but what is this stuff? Tofu or dofu, based on the Chinese spelling, is a food that is made in much the same way that people make dairy-based cheese. First, you coagulate soy milk. Okay, let me back up. As with cheese, the first thing you need to do is start with milk and in our crazy world they use like animals milk can you believe that like like the milk of cows and sheep and goats to make this stuff wouldn't it be cool if they could make like lion cheese or mouse cheese what about cheese based on human milk that would be interesting okay i digress but you get the point so to make tofu the first thing you need to do is start with soy milk and most tofu makers make their own soy milk, which can, anyone can do by soaking, grinding, boiling, and straining dried or sometimes fresh, but less commonly fresh soybeans. And so you have your soy milk and then you add a coagulant. Well, what's a coagulant and what does it do? When you coagulate something, you cause it to curdle. In other words, you transform it from a liquid into a soft semi-solid or solid mass. Most of us have seen curdling when cow's milk starts to go bad and you see little semi-solid white lumps floating around. So those are curds. Now that's a process of curdling to indicate that it's spoiling, that it's turning sour, but there are other ways to sour milk intentionally. And you do this by adding an agent that will produce the souring effect. Acidic liquid substances are the most obvious, such as vinegar or lemon juice. So for instance, I mentioned this in my new cookbook, my new baking cookbook, The Joy of Vegan Baking, that to make buttermilk, quote unquote, all you need to do is add lemon juice or vinegar to your non-dairy milk. And what you've essentially got is buttermilk. What you essentially have is sour milk. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about curdling cow's milk before I continue with soy milk. So you understand this process and, and the parallels for animal based cheese. What is most often used as a curdling agent is rennet, rennet, R E N N E T. Rennet is essentially a bunch of enzymes produced in the stomach of mammals to help the offspring digest the mother's milk. One of these enzymes, causes the milk to coagulate, to curdle, or to separate into solids, curds, and liquid, whey. So now you understand what Little Miss Muffet was eating. Couldn't tell you why she'd want to eat it, but at least now you know what it was. She was eating curds and whey. Curds and whey are the solid and liquid results of curdled milk. For cow's milk cheese, the rennet is extracted from the fourth stomach of young calves. And where would you find an abundance of young calf stomachs? The veal industry, of course, the stomachs used to get rennet for cheese are a byproduct of veal production. Each ruminant produces the special kind of rennet needed to digest the mother's milk. So there's kid goat rennet that's used especially for goat's milk cheese and lamb rennet for sheep's milk cheese, etc. Now, just a quick note about the health considerations of this. I, I mentioned that increased acidity in cow's milk causes curdling, right? Let's go a little deeper. What's actually happening is that the milk proteins, the casein, is tangling up into solid masses or curds. The rest, which contains only whey proteins, is the whey. In cow's milk, 80 to 87% of the proteins are caseins. Now, if you haven't read T. Colin Campbell's The China Study yet, I cannot recommend it highly enough. 
I urge you to read it. T. Colin Campbell is a highly respected researcher and policy advisor in the field of diet and cancer. He's Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry at Cornell University, and he has had a long career in research and teaching and in the development of national international studies on diet and nutrition and health. About casein, he says that it is the number one carcinogen, i.e. cancer-causing substance, that people come in contact with on a daily basis, okay? We're consuming, drinking, swallowing, digesting this stuff every time we drink animal milk or eat animal-based cheese. And cheese is even worse because the casein is super concentrated. So that's just something to consider. So back to rennet. Now, there's vegetarian rennet, and sometimes it's used in the production of kosher cheeses, but just keep in mind that though rennet can be produced by plants that have coagulating properties such as nettles or thistles or mallow, as in marshmallow, you probably didn't know that marshmallows that are now made with gelatin, with the boiled hooves and bones and other leftover body parts of the slaughter industry, they used to be made, marshmallows used to be made with the marshmallow plant because the plant itself has this kind of gelatinous uh, coagulating substance in the plant. Anyway, so though plant-based rennet is technically possible to create, nearly all vegetarian kosher cheeses are produced with either microbial rennet or genetically modified rennet. Microbial rennet is produced by using certain molds that are fermented, and apparently using microbial rennet produces a slightly bitter-tasting cheese. So with the development of genetic engineering, scientists started using calf genes to modify some bacteria, fungus, or yeast to make them produce chimera. Chymosin. chymosin is one of the enzymes found in rennet. Chymosin, produced by genetically modified organisms, was the first artificially produced enzyme to be registered and allowed by the FDA in the USA. In 1999, about 60% of U.S. hard cheese was made with genetically engineered chymosin. So I just thought that was an interesting little tidbit. And people think tofu is gross. I mean, like, if you're eating animal-based cheese, you're either consuming byproducts of the veal industry, or you're consuming, you know, you know, enzymes from a calf's stomach, or you're consuming genetically engineered enzymes based on calf genes. Tofu. <laughs> there are no calf genes in tofu. Anyway, so that's rennet, used to curdle animal milk and make animal-based cheese. Now we can return to tofu. So as I said, you have to have a coagulant added to your soy milk to curdle it. And for commercial tofu, the two coagulant types most commonly added are acid-based and salt-based. An example of a salt-based coagulant is calcium sulfate, which is essentially tasteless. Tofu that's made with calcium sulfate is obviously rich in calcium, and such tofu is pretty common. Tofu made with calcium sulfate tends to be Chinese-style tofu, which is tender but slightly brittle in texture. Other salt coagulants used are chloride type nigari salts, magnesium chloride and calcium chloride. These are the coagulants used to make Japanese style tofu, the smooth and tender texture. Calcium chloride is a common coagulant for tofu in North America. And you'll recognize this coagulant on the list of ingredients because it will most likely say nigari which consists primarily of magnesium chloride. It's produced from seawater after the sodium chloride is removed and the water is evaporated, okay? Now acid coagulants, another coagulant that's used mostly for silken or soft tofu is gluconodelta-lactone, well, GDL. It's a naturally occurring organic acid and it produces a very fine textured tofu that's almost jelly-like and think silken tofu. And tofu producers may choose to use one or more of these coagulants as they each play a role in producing a desired texture in the finished tofu. So when you notice a different taste or texture in tofu, depending on the brand, this is why a lot of it depends on the coagulant used. The coagulant mixture is dissolved into water and the solution is then stirred into boiled soy milk until the mixture curdles. So now you've got your curds, which in the process, which like in the process of making dairy-based cheese, you press these curds. And these curds are processed differently depending on the form of tofu that's being made. For soft or silken tofu, the soy milk is curdled directly in the tofu's selling package. For standard firm Asian tofu, the soy curd is cut, 
and strained of excess liquid using cheesecloth or muslin, and then it's pressed to produce a soft cake. Firmer tofus are further pressed to remove even more liquid, okay? Now let's talk about these different texture varieties in greater detail. So you got your soft and silken. Soft or silken tofu is undrained tofu, and it contains the highest moisture content of all fresh tofus. Its texture can be described as similar to that of very fine custard. In Korea and Japan, the traditional soft tofu is made with seawater, like we mentioned before. Again, nigari is what you'll see as the coagulant. Because it's nearly impossible to pick up this type of tofu with chopsticks, it's generally eaten with a spoon. It's very fine. It's very custard-like. Edamame tofu, which is another kind of Japanese tofu. I had this once in a Japanese restaurant. It's a Japanese type of tofu made from edamame, which is fresh soybeans and it's pale green in color and it's often studded with little edamame beans you know little whole edamame delicious now you'd pretty much use silken or soft tofu when you want to make something creamy such as puddings mousses pie fillings and you can also use it for salad dressings or sauces and Silken tofu also works great in baked goods instead of using chicken's eggs. And I'll get back to this in one second. So when you go to look for silken tofu in the grocery store, you may find soft or silken tofu in the refrigerated section, but you may also find silken tofu packaged in aseptic boxes, in these vacuum packed boxes that do not require refrigeration. So you'll find them on the shelf of the grocery store, not in the refrigerated section, and that's fine. Mori new is the most common, the most popular type of, of this kind of vacuum packed tofu. And it will usually be found in like the Asian section by the, by the soy sauce. If you don't use the whole amount of this silken tofu, but this is this, this goes for any texture tofu, firm, extra firm, whatever. If you don't use the entire block of tofu, you must submerge it in water and put it in, you know, in a container and store it in the refrigerator once you open it. Okay. And you can change the water every day to keep the tofu fresh for about a week. But you can keep the vacuum-packed aseptic box of tofu before you open it in your cupboard for up to a year. Now, it can start to get confusing when you look at the aseptic box of tofu. And notice that even though it says silken, it will also say soft or firm or extra firm. These are just degrees within the texture of silken tofu itself. And you can notice slight variations. So even if it says extra firm... This is not the type of tofu you're going to take home and grill or stir fry. It's much too soft for such a purpose. So in terms of these variations with silken tofu, my advice would be to follow recipes as they're noted. If a recipe calls for silken soft tofu, use it. If a recipe calls for silken firm, use it. But in general, silken firm is kind of a good standard to use for making the silky creamy dishes that you're, that you're looking for. Now, I mentioned before that silken tofu is also great to use in baked goods instead of chicken's eggs, and I may have already talked about this in an episode about replacing eggs. I think it was called uh, Better Than Eggs, and you can also find this, obviously, in my new cookbook. You can pre-order the cookbook, by the way, off of my website, um, and the cookbook is The Joy of Vegan Baking, um, and you can obviously find more details in there about baking without chicken's eggs, but here are some tips for using silken tofu. You just whip about a quarter of a cup of silken tofu in a blender or a food processor until it's smooth and creamy, leaving no chunks. You may need to turn off the food processor and scrape down the sides, but you just basically want to cream it up. And I find that this type of egg in baked goods works really well when you want rich, dense, moist cakes and brownies, but you can also use a little less to create lighter cakes, such as um, we have a blueberry orange cake, which is in our uh, recipe that's in our tofu and tempeh recipe packet. And there's other recipes in that section that also call for silken tofu, such as the no-bake chocolate peanut butter pie, which is quite popular, and the chocolate pudding tart with raspberry sauce, which is also a favorite. And again, these are in the new cookbook, but if you can't wait, you can order them online you know, through our online cookbook recipe packages. Now, many grocery stores do carry the Mori New Silken Tofu these days, but you should definitely find it in a natural food store. If your local grocer, or even in an Asian market, actually, that's a really good place to find it too. And if your local grocery doesn't carry it, request it. Look for the vacuum-packed Silken Tofu on the shelves, like I said, rather than in the refrigerated section. And if you still can't find it, I do sell it online in my online store, and I do sell the organic one. So you can go to CompassionateCooks.com, click on the button that says Stock Your Pantry, and go to the category called Food Pantry essentials it's on the second page or so in that section and by the way 
because soybeans are a highly sprayed crop and many soybeans are genetically modified, I do recommend buying organic. Anytime you buy a soybean based food, such as tempeh, tofu, soy milk, miso, or just the edamame soybeans, as the standards are right now, if something is organic, it is not genetically modified. So for now, we're good, but stay tuned. Now, firm or extra firm tofu. You would use firm or extra firm tofu when you want to grill it, bake it, stir fry it, stick it on a skewer, basically when you want the tofu to keep its shape. So even if you're using it for something like an eggless egg salad, uh, the recipe for which is also in my online cookbook or demonstrated on our DVD, if you want to make this kind of you know tofu salad, this is what I call an eggless egg salad, you still want extra firm tofu because you still want it to have body, right? You still want it to have texture. Now, the, the more you cook with tofu, the more you understand what textures and brands work best for your purposes. I've raved about Wildwood's tofu for years, and I continue to rave. Their Super Firm is a really fantastic tofu, and its distribution is spreading far and wide. So ask your lo local grocer to carry that. It's really firm, and it's full of texture, and it's just delicious. But because it's so firm, the Super Firm, that is. If I'm making something like a tofu scramble, I like to use a combination of extra firm and super firm or even a combination of firm and extra firm. If I use all super firm, the, the result of the scramble might be a little too rubbery. So I just know the different variations that I want depending on the result I want. You know, I, you just get to know this as you cook with tofu more. And the same goes for something like medium tofu. If a recipe calls for medium, just use it. But I I don't use medium that often. Again, you'll just get more comfortable with the different textures of tofu and you'll know what brand you need and what texture you need based on the dish you're making. I promise you, you will get more comfortable with it. It's like this, you know, we all learn to cook the same way. We all learn to, you know, cook chickens and, you know, cows and fish and turkeys and we just didn't learn to do this. So, it's just a matter of learning some new skills and learning to cook with some other foods and then you'll get familiar with that. It's it's kind of a, just a new learning process. You just have to trust it and you have to be consistent. Another thing you can do with firm or extra firm or super firm tofu is freeze it. And this is my absolute favorite thing to do. So you come home from the store, you got your tofu in hand, and it should be in a tub of water, right? I'm not talking about the silken tofu now. I'm talking about the firm or the extra firm that's in the tub of water. And you would, t or in a vacuum packaged, a vacuum sealed package of, uh, of tofu that's still in water, fresh water packed tofu. Just take it home and throw it right in the freezer. Don't open it. Don't do anything. Just throw the whole thing in the freezer. Now, now leave it in there at least overnight, but it obviously can stay in there for for a few months. Now, when you're ready to use it, you take it out of the freezer, you thaw it on the counter for a few hours, basically before you go to work. Just put it on the counter, and I think it thaws faster on the counter than in the fridge. So just thaw it on the counter and perhaps not in direct sunlight. And when you're ready to use it, you open up the package and you dump out the water. And at this point, you hold the block of tofu over a huge bowl or the sink and you squeeze out all the water. It will literally be like a sponge. Tons, tons of water will come out after you've thawed it. Okay. So squeeze it, squeeze it, and kind of be gentle because it becomes a little more brittle as you're squeezing it because you're removing all this water. You're removing all of the the water that basically keeps it together. So it gets a little more brittle. So just squeeze it. Now, what's the advantage of doing this? Well, first of all, you've squeezed out all this water and you can literally see now how porous the tofu is. So what does that mean? Well, you've gotten rid of all the water and now created all this room, all these pores for what? For another marinade to soak into for a marinade to soak into the tofu for another flavor to soak into the tofu. So at this point, you can marinate the tofu in your favorite marinade for an hour or overnight, whatever. And then you can add it to your saute pan. You can add a little olive oil if you want or on a nonstick pan with no oil at all. And you put it on the grill or whatever you want to do with it. But at that point, you can you know marinate it and then use it the way you would use just tofu that wasn't frozen. 
The other thing you've done is you've changed the texture of the tofu completely. Tofu already has a great texture when it's really firm, but it's even chewier after having been frozen and thawed. And I personally like the texture even better than if it wasn't frozen at all. And I love regular tofu, but I really love when it's um, frozen and thawed. And I usually use this chewier tofu on my salads. I just cut it up into little cubes or I use it to saute and make a stir fry. I love the texture. Also, at this point, it's really great to crumble up, and like I said, it'll happen kind of easily because it's more brittle, and you can add it to pasta sauce or to chili. It's very chewy, and I think it's a better choice when you want that texture, when you want that chewy texture in these kinds of dishes than the more processed vegetarian meats that are on the market just because it's a whole food. It's a whole soy food as opposed to you know kind of all those processed foods, but the result is the same. It's a lot chewier, and some people really like that because it adds that, that satisfaction that people seemingly get from chewing fat and chewing flesh, right? It's that kind of satisfying, chewy texture. Now, I've probably covered this before, but I've heard naysayers of vegetarianism say, well, vegetarians clearly have some kind of latent desire to eat meat if they want to eat vegetarian meats or if they seek out that meaty, chewy texture. Clearly, you really want to keep eating meat. And I just disagree with that because people don't necessarily stop eating animal flesh because they stopped liking it. They stop eating animal flesh because they don't want to contribute to animal cruelty. The other thing is, and I may have said this before too, we don't crave the flesh of animals. We're not true carnivores who salivate at the thought of eating bloody flesh and muscles and raw sinews and tendons. I mean, that's that makes us kind of sick when we think about it that way. Uh, we, are, we are the only animal who, who eats meat, who has to cook it first and has to do a lot to it to actually make it edible. But what we do crave is flavor and we crave familiarity and we crave texture. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting that chewiness, with wanting that texture that's familiar to you. So there you have it. Freeze it, thaw it, squeeze out the water, and enjoy the chewy texture. Now, I just talked about how to press tofu to get out some of the water by freezing it and thawing it. Now, you can also press the tofu without freezing and thawing it first, but you don't really press out that much water as you do with the other method, but I'll just let you know how to do it. So if you wanted to just press out some of the water, you can just wrap the tofu block in a dish towel, put it on a plate, and just put something really heavy on top of it, like I don't know, a bunch of heavy books or a heavy pot. And 20 minutes later or so, probably even sooner than that, the towel will be soaked through with the water. If you want to wrap it in another towel, you can do that again. Put something really heavy on top of it and you'll get some of the water out. But again, you'll not get as much water out as if you freeze it first, uh, as when you freeze it first and, and, and then thaw it. So try it yourself. You'll see what I mean about freezing it. It's really cool. And it also means that you can get some tofu in advance, not have to worry about it going bad, you know, so quickly, you know, in a, in a week or more, but uh, you can freeze a bunch and then just keep it in the freezer. And when you want to use it, there it is. So let's talk about a few of the things you can do with extra firm tofu, you know, and, and this goes also for the frozen thawed, you know, let's talk about some of the things you can do with the firmer, the firmer tofus, a few quick dishes you can make for lunch or dinner. Now, I already mentioned the fact that the silken is pretty much used for, for pudding or pie. So we're just talking about the extra or, you know, the extra firm or, or the super firm for this purpose. Using tofu in a stir fry is the most obvious use for this delicious food. And there's a couple of things you can do. First of all, tofu has a fair amount of its own fat. You know, it's good fat, high, it's high in monounsaturated fats and omega-3 fatty acids. So when you cook it, you really don't need to use any oil. It will get golden brown and crispy on its own without oil. So what you do is you just cut up the tofu into cubes or slices or patties or whatever size or shape you want. And you place them in a nonstick saute pan. Now, you just let them get golden brown and crispy on one side before turning it over and don't fuss with it, don't push it around, don't stand there moving it, just let it get crispy on one side and then flip it, no oil, about 10 minutes each side and it gets nice and crispy. And while the tofu is cooking like this in its own pan, in a separate saute pan, you can start cooking up your vegetables for the stir fry, your peppers or onions, squash, mushrooms, whatever you wanna to add to your stir fry. And when the vegetables are nearly cooked, and again, you don't want your vegetables overcooked, you want them al dente still, you just add your crispy tofu cut up into little cubes or whatever, and add the stir fry marinade or sauce or whatever you're using. And, and you just stir fry a little longer until the tofu gets heated through with the sauce. Okay. Now you can serve it over quinoa or brown rice and you have a great stir fry. If you don't know what quinoa is, then check out my podcast on my five favorite foods. I'll talk 
I talk all about quinoa on that um, particular episode. Now, just a quick note about nonstick pans, because this question may be on your mind. Having heard me say use a nonstick pan, it usually comes up in class when I recommend nonstick pans. Some people are concerned about the link between cancer and a chemical that's used in the manufacturing of Teflon. First of all, DuPont is phasing out this chemical, and it will be phased out completely by the year 2010. I, I understand that they've removed 90% of it in their current line of Teflon pans. So that's one thing is the chemical will be gone, and this whole point will be moved. But the reason I feel okay using nonstick pans is one, I use nonstick pans in a rotation with other pans. So I don't only use nonstick pans. I also use anodized steel. And of course, you can also use stainless steel or copper. And two, I really take care of my nonstick pans. I don't use metal on them. I don't scratch them. If I do scratch them, if you have a totally scratched up nonstick pan, get rid of it and get a new one. Uh, the, the, the thing is, the risk they're seeing between cancer and this chemical has more to do with the people who are living around the manufacturing plant, not in people's kitchens. Also, you'd have to heat your pan to over 600 degrees with no food in it. It to see any kind of risk. And we just don't heat our pots and pans to that high a temperature. Finally, for me, there are so many real risks uh, associated with eating meat, real cancer risks associated with eating meat and eating dairy products and eating high fat diets that I would rather see people make more substantial changes if they want to reduce the risk of getting cancer than worrying about Teflon. If you're still eating meat and dairy, but are concerned about getting cancer because of your Teflon pans, I, I just don't think you're doing much to reduce your, your risk of cancer. I'd rather see you get the cancer culprits out of your diet, the meat, the dairy, the eggs, and, and, and having a low-fat plant-based diet and not worry about using nonstick pans. Okay, so that's just my opinion. Um, and that's why I'm okay with using nonstick pans. And it's a great way to cut fat um, from your diet, added fat, by just sauteing the tofu in these pans as opposed to using more oil. Another way to use extra firm tofu in a meal is to make Thai curry. Again, there are recipe packets on my website, but essentially you'd add curried paste and coconut milk and whatever vegetables you want to add, and you throw in some extra firm or super firm tofu into your curry. And frankly, I think curry, particularly the, the tofu in the curry, is even better the day after you make it. Yum. Um, I think I mentioned the eggless egg salad, which you can prepare by mashing up extra firm tofu and mixing it with eggless mayonnaise, such as mayonnaise or vegetables or my favorite, which is the wildwood uh, garlic aioli, and mix it up with some chopped raw vegetables such as carrots, celery, peppers, adding some salt, adding some cumin and some turmeric. You have a great, a great uh, eggless egg salad. You can make barbecue tofu by just sauteing some of the tofu, like I mentioned above, and just maybe cutting the tofu into strips and putting that browned tofu in an eight or nine inch casserole dish. And then you pour some barbecue sauce over it and throw it in the oven for 20 to 30 minutes, just kind of heating it through and getting all the flavors together. And then you can serve that as a main dish or you can make a barbecue sandwich out of it. I don't know, the oven should be about 350. You can grill tofu and you can add it to a grilled vegetable sandwich on focaccia with some avocado and some balsamic vinegar. You can make tofu bacon similar to the tempeh bacon I recommend in that episode, the one on, uh, I think, again, it's under my fav five favorite foods. It, basically, it, you can make a bacon by using maple syrup and water and some tamari soy sauce and some liquid smoke. And you marinate the tofu or the tempeh for, you know, minimum 20, 30 minutes, maximum mm, overnight or something. And then you just saute it in a little bit of oil, in this case, uh, in a saute pan. So that's like a tofu bacon you can make and then obviously make a BLT. You can make a tofu ricotta cheese uh, to use in lasagna or stuffed shells. You can scramble tofu together with your favorite vegetables and turmeric to give it that yellow kind of egg-like coloring. And this delicious dish can be used you know, for breakfast, you can make it at night, you can make it for dinner, who said you have to have it only for breakfast. And you can also use it for a tofu rancheros by wrapping it in a tortilla and then serving it with some black beans on salsa. You can add cubes of firm tofu to miso soup. So again, there are recipes on my website. There are actually more packets under the tofu and tempeh section than any other section. Just a few other thoughts about tofu before we wrap up. You see sometimes in your grocery store, particularly in Asian stores, that uh, the tofu is being sold in bulk. It's just kind of sitting in tubs of water. 
I'm a little wary of this only because it's often not organic. I don't know how long it's been sitting there uncovered, exposed to possible bacteria. And I just prefer to get tofu that I know, you know, is organic and fresh. Some farmers markets are now selling fresh tofu in bulk in this way, but that's a little different because the batch of tofu was often made just, just that morning and it's usually organic and you can speak directly with the people making the tofu. So hmm, that's kind of how I feel about that. So tofu is such a versatile food. You can do so much with it, but definitely give it a chance. It's really satisfying. It's really filling. It's a great source of protein. If that's something you're concerned about, everyone's obsessed about protein, but it is a wonderful source of protein. Why? Because it's based on a bean and beans are really high in protein. So definitely get a variety of foods in your diet, including beans, including beans other than tofu. It's high in omega-3 fatty acids. Like I said, it's high in monounsaturated fats. It's a great source of iron and other minerals such as calcium, especially if you get the tofu that uses a calcium base as a coagulant, it will say calcium enriched on the package. It's just incredibly versatile. So don't be afraid of it. Just don't be afraid. Just experiment with it. Trust it. Trust me. Perhaps someday you'll get to the same place as me where it becomes difficult to cook with it because you want to gobble up the entire block before you even get to use it in whatever dish you're preparing. Thank you again to Sunergia Foods for their sponsorship. Visit their website, find their food, ask your local grocery store to carry their tofu. It's really fantastic. I kid you not. And also their feta and their blue cheese. If you'd like to sponsor an episode to help keep this podcast going, please visit CompassionateCooks.com. Click on support our podcast. Your sponsorship is much needed and much appreciated. Until next time, take care and may your daily choices be a reflection of your deepest values. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening.